Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Merci d'être des nôtres aujourd'hui. Notre pays est confronté à des défis considérables depuis le début de l'année. D'abord, la tragédie du vol 752 qui a été abattu près de Téhéran. Ensuite, l'épidémie du coronavirus et les Canadiens touchés. Et de dernièrement, la crise ferroviaire. Plus tôt ce matin, nous avons réuni les membres du groupe d'intervention en cas d'urgence pour faire le point sur ces enjeux. Je veux d'abord faire une mise à jour sur la tragédie du vol 752 et le coronavirus avant de passer au barrage qui paralyse le transport ferroviaire. Regarding Flight 752, the Minister of Foreign Affairs' team gave an update on the status of consular assistance being provided to families. Minister Champagne held another meeting with the International Response Coordination Group last week in Munich. I also announced that Canada was working with its international partners on a Safe Skies initiative that will ensure that such a tragedy should never happen again. The Minister of Transport also talked about the latest developments regarding the investigation and reiterated the need for a transparent analysis of the black box data. We continue to work closely with grieving families to make sure they have all the support they need during this extremely difficult time. Our government will not rest until justice is done and accountability is achieved. Pour ce qui est du coronavirus, les 129 Canadiens qui se trouvaient à bord du bateau de croisière Diamond Princess et qui ne présentaient pas de symptômes sont arrivés au Canada plus tôt ce matin. Les passagers qui ont été hospitalisés à Tokyo reçoivent l'appui du personnel canadien. Et de plus, 218 Canadiens qui avaient été placés en quarantaine à Trenton ont pu quitter la base militaire. J'en profite pour remercier les autorités locales, provinciales et territoriales de santé publique pour leur travail dans ce dossier. Le gouvernement et les autorités canadiennes continuent de travailler de près avec nos partenaires ici et à l'étranger pour assurer la protection des Canadiens et freiner la propagation du coronavirus. Sur les barrages qui paralysent des infrastructures clés, soyons clairs, tous les Canadiens en payent le prix. Des gens qui ne peuvent pas se rendre au travail, d'autres qui ont perdu leurs emplois. Des, bi des biens essentiels, non seulement à notre économie, mais à nos communautés, ne peuvent pas être acheminés. The situation as it currently stands is unacceptable and untenable. Everyone involved is worried. Canadians have been patient. Our government has been patient. But it has been two weeks, and the barricades need to come down now. The issue we face today began with a disagreement over a provincial natural gas pipeline in British Columbia. What was a matter of provincial jurisdiction has since turned into a broader question on the nature and extent of Indigenous rights, resulting in blockades across the country. That's why the federal government had to involve itself directly, and a week and a half ago, both to address these underlying issues and restore sail rail service, we engaged. From day one, our ministers have engaged directly with Indigenous leaders and premiers. Our work was always focused on finding a peaceful and lasting resolution in a way that builds trust and respect among all parties involved. That focus does not change. This is a complex issue, and the situation we now find ourselves in is a delicate one. History has taught us how governments can make matters worse if they fail to exhaust all other possible avenues. When some urged us to use force immediately, we chose dialogue and mutual respect. When others urged us to give up, we extended a hand in good faith. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, the House Leader, and the Minister of Indigenous Services have been reaching out to concerned parties, including representatives from the Mohawk and Wet'suwet'en nations and others. At the same time, the Minister of Transport and the Minister of Finance are fully seized with the economic impacts of the blockades on workers, businesses, 
farmers, travelers, and families right across the country. We have engaged rail carriers to use temporary alternatives to prevent the most severe shortages and economic impacts. The Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness has also been working with provincial counterparts and liaising with law enforcement across the country. I have been in close contact with Premiers, including Premier Horgan, since the very beginning to coordinate our efforts and our response as we work to find a peaceful resolution. I want to assure Canadians that we are engaging at all levels to resolve this quickly and mitigate the very real impacts of these blockades on people. When I addressed the House of Commons on Tuesday, I sent a clear message to the Wet'suwet'en and Mohawk nations as well as Indigenous leaders across the country. I said that our government is listening. I reiterated our commitment to a peaceful resolution. I expressed our desire to work in partnership with all parties concerned. That was four days ago. In the time since, our government has kept engaging at all levels. We repeated our calls for collaboration. We showed respect. And in parallel, the RCMP is standing down their command post at the 29-kilometer mark along the Morris West Forest Service Road, one of the specific demands of the Wet'suwet'en. But Canadians who are feeling the very real impact of these blockades are running out of patience. I have found it useful in these situations to reflect on two different types of protest. One is grounded in deep and lasting negative relations, historic wrongs, historic marginalization, grievances that are legitimate in that they have not been listened to, not been engaged with, not been respected over decades and indeed centuries. Those are things that we need to address as a country and something that we have worked very hard to address over the past years, to show respect and partnership for voices, Indigenous voices, that have not had their fundamental rights respected by the governance structures of this country. And then there are other protests that use or engage with ind Indigenous protests to call out a particular project with which they disagree, to advance uh, a particular point of view that is often deeply felt and important, but not anchored in the deep wrongs that have been done in ignoring and marginalizing Indigenous leadership and Indigenous voices in this country. Earlier today, I once again convened a meeting with the Incident Response Group to address the blockades. And here's the reality. Every attempt at dialogue has been made, but discussions have not been productive. We can't have dialogue when only one party is coming to the table. For this reason, we have no choice but to stop making the same overtures. Of course, we will never close the door on dialogue, and our hand remains extended should someone want to reach for it. In fact, Ministers Miller and Bennett just got off a call with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief just minutes ago. But the fact remains. The barricades must now come down. The injunctions must be obeyed, and the law must be upheld. Let me be clear, our resolve to pursue the reconciliation agenda with Indigenous peoples is as strong as ever. There are historic wrongs to right. There are gaps to be closed. There is a relationship to be renewed and new relationships to be built. Canada is ready for this. Canadians want this. But hurting 
Canadian families from coast to coast to coast does nothing to advance the cause of reconciliation. <laughs>